There's an easy explanation why we're committed to solutions. So that whole period of time when we're in that mode of learning about the problem and ideating and everything like that, that's a lot of uncertainty. That's time where people like you who have this strong work ethic, who think I always have to be productive, I always have to be executing, are saying to themselves, oh my God, I'm falling further and further behind. What am I doing? I got to pick something soon. The pressure is building. Oh my God, Chris just told me that every day that goes by another competitor is possibly finding the solution. I got to jump on something. And so we naturally have this emotional desire to jump to the solution. But that's not the fastest way to get there. The fastest way to get there is to actually fully understand the problem, come up with a broad set of solutions. And then when you do pick a solution, pick it with confidence that you've gone through a process that allowed you to make a good decision. So welcome uh, to Blitz Scaling Yourself. I'm with Chris Ye, uh, and my name is Julian Newman. Uh, Chris is one of the world's most famous investors. Uh, his uh, book, Blitz Scaling, uh, was co-authored with Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, and the foreword was written by Bill Gates. Uh, Chris's book is taught at um, all business schools, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, etc. cetera. Uh, so welcome, Chris. It's great to be back, Julian. I was away in Bangkok, so I apologize for not being able to be here last week, but uh, it's good to be back. And unfortunately, I was in Bangkok. Um, a few days before you got there and the stars did not align. Well, how long are you going to be in Taipei for? One or two months. Uh, I was going to say, I might be passing through Taipei in November, but that will be too far away. Yeah, this is a um, sad reality of our lives. Mm. So Chris, one of the challenges or one of the things that's top of mind for me as I um, uh, as I'm discovering what uh, I, I can build as a next business or what's the idea that would get me really excited um, is, you know, thinking about whether I should be, you know, creating solutions or whether I should be discovering problems. And you have a different, uh, you know, structure or different two buckets. Yes. Your buckets are are you primarily in learning mode or are you primarily in results mode? And, and I'll let you unpack that. Absolutely. So a lot of this comes from my training in design thinking. I studied product design as an undergraduate at Stanford. My undergrad advisor was David Kelly, the founder and CEO of IDEO. And so I got a good dose of design thinking at a young age. And what we learn in design thinking is that there is an entire process to coming up with solutions to problems. And every step in that process matters. So the basic process runs through the following steps. First, we begin with research. And that may be reading books and articles. It may mean talking to users and customers. It may mean experimenting and trying stuff yourself. And the whole objective is to gather information on the overall space. After that, after you research, you're going to define the problem because guess what? You know, when you define the problem up front and you haven't done the research, you may not be defining the real problem. The real problem is often difficult to see and may not be the first thing that comes to mind. And so you'll come up with a variety of different ways to define the problem based on the research that you've done. Once you've successfully defined the problem, then what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and you're going to ideate. In other words, come up with potential solutions. Uh, I used to have this process where I'd actually do it on sheets of paper. And on each sheet of paper, I would just try to come up with as many ideas as possible. And I also sometimes had as an exercise pieces of paper with verbs on it, things like inside out, reverse, upside down, to allow me to think about the problem from different angles. And I would just come up with potential solution after potential solution. Many of these solutions would be terrible, but that's the nature of brainstorm. You're supposed to come up with ideas, as many as possible, without uh, casting judgment up front. By the way, at any pro point in time, as you're doing research or defining the problem, solutions may come into your mind. That's okay. Just go ahead and write those down. If you don't write them down, they're just going to stick in your mind and prevent you from seeing other solutions. So go ahead and write them down. Make sure you have them somewhere. That way your brain will know, hey, that's okay. I don't need to keep thinking about this thing. I can move on to other things as well. 
After you've ideated on all these problems, then you'll actually go ahead and prototype. You'll actually try them out. And when you're trying them out, you're trying them out maybe with low resolution prototypes, maybe a, a complete uh, exact replica of what you want to do in production. But you're going to go ahead and try to gather as much information as quickly as possible about whether or not your solution works. And what about your solution works? Because you're probably going to have to refine your solution many times. And in fact, that's where the iteration comes in. You're going to go ahead and iterate. After you've gone ahead, you've run a prototype, you've gathered some new information, you probably have some new nuances. You go back and do more research. Then you'll define the problem and redefine it if you discovered some new nuances. Then you're going to ideate, you're going to prototype, and you just keep doing this over and over again until you find a solution that you're comfortable with. And only when you have a solution that you're comfortable with will you shift into that results mode. All this time you've been in learning mode, where the goal is to learn as quickly as possible, as inexpensively as possible. So you're going to be looking at the cost of resources, and you're going to be looking at the cost in terms of calendar days. But then once you get into results mode, what you're really looking to do is to see, okay, well, what is the return on investment? What are the revenues that we generate per inputs that we put in? And there you're looking at outputs and inputs rather than trying to figure out what you've learned. So something that's counterintuitive is that the activities that you perform when you're in learning mode may be the same activities that you perform when you're in results mode. So, so an example uh, of something that I've been doing is generating situations, real world situations mm -hmm. that I can observe so that I can learn about problems. Um, and, and the example that I gave you is I created, I, I matched up one of my friends is a very experienced developer at Google with a, a computer science student at uh, Princeton. They're doing a um, coding exercise together. And then based on that situation, A, I'm gonna observe them do their conversation afterwards, and then I'm gonna ask them questions uh, based on this real world situation. Um, but in a way that is execution, like that is uh, you know, offering a service, I guess, uh, and doing something, it's not, it, it's not pure research, but the way in which it is qualitatively different from, let's say, when I was building my last business dedicated, is that I am not trying to get results. I am trying to learn about these people's problems. That's right. And again, it may be the same thing. Actually, the, one of the great principles of experimentation is the closer you can get to the real thing, the better. And so in many ways, it's actually a good thing if the activity during the learning phase is similar to the activity in the results phase. But there are exceptions. So you just mentioned how you set up an artificial situation. That's because by setting up an artificial situation, you can conduct a perfect experiment. You can make sure you're testing exactly what you're looking for without a whole bunch of other confounding factors. And when you set it up and run it as an experiment yourself, you can also do things like interrupt in the middle of the experiment and say, hey, what's going on? What are you saying? I just noticed you guys did this. What were you thinking? And so there are other ways to learn from an experiment that you wouldn't be able to learn from a production sales process, for example. So yes, you should actually have activities that are very similar. And in some ways, the more similar, the better. But the key difference is during learning mode, you can interrupt and potentially sacrifice results for the sake of greater learning. Whereas when you're in results mode, you may go ahead and bypass opportunities for learning if you think it's going to deliver the results that you need. Because guess what? In production, as you're scaling up your sales team, your goal is no longer as much about learning. You will say, we've probably learned enough. We may learn some more refinements, but guess what? It's good enough. Right now, we've got to grow. We've got to blitz scale to go ahead and use one of the terms I helped coin. And therefore, I don't care about learning as much as I care about you guys just getting as many customers in as possible. So actually, something came to mind that we didn't discuss earlier is because uh, you, you talk about blitzscaling here, when does it, like, when do you get to a point where you should be seeking resources that are not just your time externally to help you accelerate? So, so is it the case that you should be um, 
trying to let's say fundraise so as to have cash yeah. only when you're you're confident enough that you're going to transition over to results mode or should you be fundraising and seeking other resources before that so it depends if you have enough resources on your own to be able to get through the learning period then you should wait because it'll be far easier to raise money from investors when you can point to them all the learning you've done and that you know what's going to work. It's a lot easier to raise money than way, that way than to say, hey, listen, we don't know what's going to happen. Give us some money so we can find out. So if you can avoid raising money before you've entered the results mode, so much the better. But sometimes that's not possible in which case you're going to go ahead and, and raise the money with the understanding of here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's the learnings that your investment is going to buy us and that will allow us to begin to scale or to go into results mode. So when I am in learning mode, right, the way that I should define ROI is, or the R is learning. Yeah. And ideally learning about problems is like the majority of, of the time is what you're doing, like not necessarily learning about solutions. Um, and then the, you know, the I, the investment are, it can be various resources, but it's primarily going to be calendar days or man hours uh, that, that, that you're investing. Um, I'll let you kind of like expand on that. Yeah, and I think that that's right. So again, there's some implicit assumptions in there. Like in the majority of cases, when you're in learning mode, you may very well be bootstrapping. And so to some extent, the resources are fixed. There's not a lot of them. And so it doesn't really matter. And really the primary constraint ends up being the calendar days. Because the every day that you do not learn is a day that your competitors might be learning is a day your competitors might be beating you to the market. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, is very hard, sometimes people say, oh, well, I'm going to bootstrap because then I don't have a ticking clock. I can take as long as is needed to get things right. And I'm like, that's assuming nobody else figures it out. If you've got something that is really valuable and you're trying to learn about it, you should probably assume that somebody else is trying to learn about it too. And you should not be dawdling. You should be trying to proceed to reaching conclusions as quickly as possible. So that's the results and the investment. However, what will happen when you shift over into results mode is you'll be looking for revenue or you'll be looking for account growth or you'll be looking for engagement. And then your investment will likely be monetary as well because once you raise money to grow, then your burn rate becomes paramount. Before, your burn rate was kind of irrelevant because you didn't have any resources. Now, you have a limited period of time in which to show progress before you raise that next round. Because, of course, it may take six months to raise a round, and you need to raise money before you actually need it. Otherwise, you're going to run out of cash if anything goes wrong along the way. And things usually do go wrong. So it's interesting. One of the dynamics I find for myself, and I think it's pretty typical I have observed with others is it's really easy to get committed to solution. Yes. Just psychologically. Yes. I don't know why it's like that. Um, oh, there's a easy, there's an easy explanation why we're committed to solutions. So that whole period of time when we're in that mode of learning about the problem and ideating and everything like that, that's a lot of uncertainty. That's time where people like you who have this strong work ethic, who think I always have to be productive, I always have to be executing, are saying to themselves, oh my God, I'm falling further and further behind. What am I doing? I got to pick something soon. The pressure is building. Oh my God, Chris just told me that every day that goes by, another competitor is possibly finding the solution. I got to jump on something. And so we naturally have this emotional desire to jump to the solution. But that's not the fastest way to get there. The fastest way to get there is to actually fully understand the problem, come up with a broad set of solutions, and then when you do pick a solution, pick it with confidence that you've gone through a process that allowed you to make a good decision. So that's kind of the thing. She's like, I'm psychologically want to be committed to a solution. Mm -hmm. And 
also just like, and, and the more I invest in a solution, the more there's like a sunk cost That's right, right. as well. So I, there's a big element to the research process or the learning process, which is managing my own psychology. Absolutely. And then doing things with, which accelerate speed tend to make me tend to like make it harder for me to, to manage my own psychology. Right. Like if, so if I'm in, in kind of like exploratory, take our time mindset, then it's easier to not commit to solutions. For example, how would you think about, about that dynamic or it's just like get stuck it up? Well, at the end of the day, that's part of your job as an entrepreneur to manage your own psychology. You got to have a sense of urgency, but you also have to not rush into things. It's encapsulated with the classic John Wooden quote. John Wooden, of course, being the legendary basketball coach of the UCLA men's basketball team who said, be quick, but don't hurry. That sounds like some crazy stuff. Wait a minute. Be quick, but don't hurry. And what it means is to act with a sense of urgency, not to dawdle, not to delay, but don't hurry. Don't rush into things. Don't do things without thinking them through. Don't do something just in order to do it. And probably a key element that is the crux of where I'm going wrong, and I think most people go wrong, is to measure progress not based on how much you're learning about the, the, the problem. So uh, things like, yes. oh, Right, it's like, hey, I have a good idea. That's good. It's like, no, that's not good. I really understand the problem and the problems of all the people involved. That it, that's what you should be patting yourself on the back for, something like that. That's right, and that's why understanding that this is an entire process helps, because you know that if you don't do a good job at the research stage and you don't do a good job at the defining the problem stage, you're going to come up with a suboptimal solution. You're going to be better off investing the time in each of those stages. Now, don't dawdle. Don't say, oh, I'm going to take six months to do research. You should be able to do it far more quickly than that. So you're going to proceed as quickly as you can, but you're not going to hurry. You're not going to rush without actually going through and doing the work. And if you do that, then you can make your decisions and start your process with a much greater degree of confidence. That still doesn't guarantee success, by the way. If there was some way to guarantee success of startups, boy, I would be the richest man alive. And this is not an answer that will guarantee success, but it's an answer that will give you the best chance of success. Now, there's a final component here, which is that, and it's something you brought up in our kind of like first uh, conversation, uh, which is there are problems that cannot be solved. Yes. Right? And so, so, and the way that you framed it is, and maybe I'm paraphrasing here, but it's like, or I am paraphrasing. It's like, there are problems that just exist and they're huge problems and they've always existed. And even if you really understand the problem, well, if there's nothing that's changed in the environment, it's very unlikely that you can solve them. Correct. Right? So... Like, how do you, that's like the why now, right? Yeah. And it's interesting to think of the why now as being related to problems rather than to solutions. Uh, but uh, how do you take that into account, especially given the fact that if you don't understand the problem deeply enough, maybe you're not going to see the why now that's related to the problem. Right. So I do think it all boils down to, you have to come up with a hypothesis for why now and then see whether or not you find that hypothesis believable. Is there evidence to support it? And do you think that's actually going to happen? The example I give is Ustream, which was the live video startup that I helped get off the ground. And with Ustream, people would ask the question, why now? Because the ability to stream video, even live, had existed before. Why would people be willing to stream live? Why would it make a difference? Why would it be a good time? And my answer to that is, yes, technology plays a role. Moore's law is reducing the cost of the bandwidth required to stream these videos. 
And so as a result, we are reaching the point of technological enablement. It's also the case that we said, hey, with the iPhone coming out and with other smartphones coming out, there's going to be a fundamental change in people being able to stream from a phone rather than having to take an image from a webcam. And that will allow people to stream things all the time as opposed to just having like a GoPro, which is doing recorded stuff. And so that will also be a catalytic factor. But the final factor was, as I said, the audience is different. We went from an era where people did not actually produce content. We didn't have a creator economy. We just had people consuming content to the Web 2.0 era of blogs and Twitter and all these things where people are, in fact, able to produce content. And they think of themselves as creators in a way they never thought of themselves as creators before. And then, of course, the final element was Twitter itself, which provided a real-time ability to alert people and market a live stream. So when people asked why now, I had a very long and fairly convincing set of changes that had occurred in the marketplace that were enabling the business. And again, look at each of those. Each of those turned out to be true. The bandwidth argument, 100% true. The creator economy argument, 100% true. The iPhone smartphone argument, 100% true. The Twitter argument, also true. All of these things ended up being true. And as a result, the why now question was answered successfully. But if you're not starting from a why now, mm -hmm. right, you're starting from a customer problem and then layering on the why now. Yes. But I didn't start, I you... didn't start Ustream from the why nows. I didn't say, what can I do if start if what am I going to do that will be successful if smartphones become successful? What am I going to be successful because people are now conditioned to be creators rather than just consumers? That's not how we approached it. In fact, in my case, I found the company and I just had to answer those questions for myself. So I was actually starting from the position of the solution, which is kind of backwards. But, you know, in this case, it was something that was so obviously a good idea that I didn't mind. But if we go back to saying, OK, well, how do we come up with the why now? I think that the why now is something where you're like, okay, here is the problem. It's a big problem. It's an important problem. Why has nobody tried to solve this problem before? And if the answer is, oh, I don't know, then gosh, you know, there's something you're overlooking. There has to be a why now answer because it can't just be that people are dumb. There is something that's changed in the environment that now enables you to come up with a good solution. And you should discover that as you learn about, like you need to understand the problem to a certain level Correct. to discover that. Correct. Or to discover that actually there is no why now and you should just deal with a different problem or a different kind of version of this problem or right. a different take on it or stuff like that. Exactly. And, you know, there are all these sort of intractable problems or wicked problems as they're described. And these wicked problems are one where I don't like the answer. Oh, it's never worked. That's how venture capitalists often answer these questions. Oh, that's never worked. We've tried that before. It doesn't work. I'm like, no, no, that's not enough of an answer. You've got to provide some thoughts on it. So one of these wicked problems is the problem of micropayments. So micropayments and the concept of micropayments has been around for decades. And people have always said, hey, you know, now is the time to look at micropayments. And I remember this in the dot-com era. I remember this in the web 2.0 era. And now we were just looking at a company the other day that was doing micropayments for video content. And the question is, why doesn't this work? And the answer can't just be, well, because it hasn't ever worked in the past. That's not a real answer. The answer has to be, okay, well, what is it that makes it so that the micropayments don't work? Theory number one, too much friction in the process. Okay, you can probably come up with some pretty low friction ways of doing things. That's how most people have focused their time and energy on the micropayments problem. They've tried to come up with a way to reduce the friction, whether it's a subscription or a very simple one-click button or what have you. But I don't think that's it. I think that the problem is a psychological problem of cognitive load. People don't want to make all of these decisions along the way. And as a result, they are unwilling, even though they claim that they would pay for things, they really don't run into things that often where they would actually pay. And in fact, bundling is the answer, right? Bundling in the sense of, 
you know, uh, the reason we still have channels on television and streaming services is the, the issue of bundling. So with micropayments, I'm like, if somebody comes up with a why now for why suddenly it will be frictionless, but more importantly, why the cognitive load will have gone away, maybe the AI is deciding for us which things to pay for and which things not to pay for, or the AI is telling us, hey, you've looked at seven of these articles, you would probably be better off just paying then maybe that will be the catalytic factor. I don't know, but someone's got to come up with something to explain it that's better than just, oh, it's never worked before. And is, should the why now be, because when I hear you talk about this, sounds like the why now is related to the solution, not to the problem. So for example, the problem could be, well, it, it, it's the why now Correct. could be, um, the problem, people the problem used to all... not need to make micropayments, now they do for this reason. Yeah. The problem, so that can exist, right? It can be either. The why now might be the problem only exists because of this. And a great example of this would be, you know, why would anyone have built a business around external battery packs before the rise of smartphones? So the rise of smartphones created a problem. These things don't have enough battery. I now need to have an external battery pack. And the entire business of Mophie is based on this. So there are clearly examples where the why now comes from the problem. But the why now can also come on the solution side. This problem has existed from time immemorial, but now we finally have a way to solve it. Well, this has been super insightful and immediately actionable for me because it's totally on the top of mind. Awesome. Uh, so, Chris, thank you for, for your time. Uh, I want to thank the uh, audience for tuning in. Uh, thank our team, Shlok and Jeremy, uh, for making all this possible. And then uh, I never do this, but I should, which is uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure to like um, our video. And if you're on a uh, podcast, uh, please subscribe and uh, leave comments, etc. And tell a friend. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Julian.